Thank you. Great to be here with you, John. Um, we are old friends, um, not from Middle East days, but from my world is flat life, which is a different life. <laughs> and um, uh, John's written a terrific book called The End of Reality, and we're going to talk about that tonight. And um, uh, at the end, I may say a few words about um, what's going on in the Middle East today, uh, for those of you who stumbled in here um, uh, <laughs> thinking about that issue as well. Um, if I were a cartoonist, John, the way a uh, picture I would draw um, of, uh, of America these days would be, a, would be a boiling pot. Now, that pot would be boiling um, just because of all of the um, uh, societal changes we're going through, through migration. Uh, it would be boiling because of the um, uh, so changes in social norms and, and gender norms that we're going through. And it would be changing because of the technology uh, rapid acceleration of technology we're going through. But, um, so the pot would be boiling on its own, but what your book is really about are four men, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, Peter Thiel, um, and um, uh, Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Sorry, I always forget <laughs> the four. Um, thank you. Um, who came along and turned the heat up on this pot. And then a guy named Donald Trump came along and took the lid off the pot um, and made it possible, permissible, and profitable uh, to say and do things to and about each other that we never did before. And that's kind of my drawing of America today. Yeah. Um, just to kick us off, would you talk about the broad thesis of the book, what you mean by the end of reality? and why you focused on these four gentlemen. Right. Thanks, Tom. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, so the New York Times ran an editorial a few weeks back that said, democracy's assassins need accomplices. And my book argues that Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen are the accomplices. That Trump wouldn't be here if there wasn't social media, if he hadn't been able to use Twitter. And so the end of reality really is that here there's kind of two views of what the future is about. One of which you've been writing about for a long time, which is that technology can be an aid to helping us deal with the basic things that are confronting us, whether it's climate change or income inequality or all those things. But the view held by these four people is that um, reality sucks. Uh, Andreessen said, we've had 5,000 years for reality work and it hasn't. So we need to create fantasy worlds for the reality deprived to live in. So that was his justification for why he supported uh, Zuckerberg's idea of the metaverse. Let me stop you right there just really super quickly. Would you identify the four gentlemen? I mean, exactly who they are? Because some people may not know all four of them. Yes. So, um, so the reality trope that they don't want to deal with, for instance, Elon Musk says that uh, the Earth is doomed, and we need a second planet to live on. So he wants us, the taxpayers, to give him $30 trillion to establish a colony on Mars. Now, if you do any research, there's nothing on Mars that anyone would want. Uh, there's no great mineral resource. We've been having, we've had Earth rovers up there for 20, almost 20 years, and they haven't discovered any special substance that would be life-giving or anything. There's obviously no oxygen, so we'd have to bring all the oxygen with us. And it's, it's, a, it's a fool's errand. So Andreessen's particular thing is... And who is Mark Andreessen? What? Who is Mark Andreessen, for people who don't know? So Mark yeah. Andreessen is the most important venture capitalist in the world, and, and he has... Two things. He's the largest factor of crypto. And so he is what people know as a whale. Um, 
the whales in, in this winter of uh, 2021, if you were watching TV and watching any football match, you would notice advertisements for crypto exchanges. So there was Matt Damon, and there was LeBron James, and there was Larry David, and there was everybody advertising, you gotta get in on crypto. And at that time, crypto was selling for about 60,000 a Bitcoin. And the whales uh, owned about 92% of all Bitcoins. That is about eight people, including Andreessen. And of course, the suckers poured in because they put $200 million of advertising into it. The whales sold their coins at 60,000 a piece. And by April, Bitcoin was down to $22,000 $22, a coin. So, I mean, it was a, a classic pyramid scheme. Um, I've talked about Zuckerberg. I mean, he believes that you should spend eight to 10 hours a day with a virtual reality helmet on, that you will have all your business meetings in virtual reality, you'll have all your travel in virtual reality, you'll have your sex in virtual reality, and, and this, this is a future he thinks is great. And, and as we'll talk about later, it may be that in a world of AI, there are millions of people with nothing to do. Uh, and maybe the idea of going into virtual reality will be a, a good thing, but, but I doubt it. So Peter Thiel's thing is the most absurd. And who is Peter Thiel? Peter Thiel is also a, a very large venture capitalist, but he also is the owner of Palantir, which is the company that has essentially perfected surveillance capitalism. Palantir is used by governments to spy on individuals in order to find the bad guys. Um, so Peter Thiel wants to live to 200 years old. And so for now, he's spending hundreds of millions of dollars to figure out how to do that. Right now, he, he has a fairly simple thing, which is he goes down to San Diego to a lab there uh, once a month and gets blood transfusions from 15-year-old boys. And his thesis behind that is that the rats in his laboratory, which is called Methuselah Labs, that's literally the name, the old rats who get blood transfusions from young rats live longer than the mm. old rats that don't. Mm. And so Peter figures it's gonna work for him. Mm. Um, just in case, he's also subscribed to uh, one of the companies, Alcor, that will freeze your body and bring you back once your disease has been cured mm. and so you can run, rule forever. Uh, part of this leads into the notion of transhumanism. What is transhumanism? So transhumanism is the notion that eventually the computer and the person will merge. It's sometimes known as the singularity, um, that basically you will upload your consciousness to a computer and you can live forever. Um, it, it also has many other aspects to it, and, and some of them relate to things like stuff that Andreessen is interested in, which is um, autonomous weapons. So Andreessen's company supports uh, Anduril, which is the largest supplier to the US of autonomous weapons. If you don't know what they are, they've sometimes been called killer robots. And the theory is that instead of a drone being operated by a guy in a trailer in Las Vegas, op, you know, remote control, these weapons have AI that makes the decisions to pull the trigger. Now in the real world, they've had a very hard time with these robots that have M16s have a very hard time distinguishing between a man with a gun and a man with a broom at 150 yards. Mm. That's, and, not, that's not good, generally. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Especially if it's the guy with the broom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so 
There's a lot of bugs to be worked out of these systems. But, but like most of these things, their theory is accelerate or die. In other words, they all call themselves accelerationists. I call them techno-determinists in the sense that the world that you and I are living in has not been determined by any vote that any of us made about this. It's been determined by these people who decided that social media is a wonderful good for everybody, despite the fact that when Facebook put the like button on in 2011 and the mobile phone and put it on the mobile phone. The like, like button. Yeah. If you look at a chart of teenage suicides, it's very flat until 2011, and then it just goes right up the cliff. Um, Why it, would the like button do that? Because the ability to compare yourself to other people is the motivating force for Instagram or TikTok or any of these things. So the more likes you get means, it's like mean girls at right. school, right? It's the more likes you get, the cooler you are, the more you're cool. And if you don't get likes, then you feel bad about yourself. And of course, if, if you compare yourself to people who are like Kim Kardashian on, on Instagram every day, you have a lot of body shaming. And so it's pretty clear, Jonathan Haidt and a lot of other psychologists have made it very clear that this is a net negative to society. And of course- And the Twitter had an analog, it was the share button. Right. Um, so, so that's what I mean by the end of reality. Now they've also fostered a political culture in which reality, i.e. truth, has no valence. Um, you know, and, and so needless to say, there's a candidate for president who's running again, to whom the idea of truth is a, a construct. It has no real meaning. And, and that is part and parcel because the media would, perhaps the exception of your organization, has been wiped out. I mean, just this week, the Washington Post laid off 200 people. The Los Angeles Times cut their staff in half. Yeah. Business Insider went, you know, is about to go bankrupt. I mean, the destruction that these barons have wrought on the creative world is astonishing. Well, let's talk about uh, that in sort of several levels. And let's start first of all with we're on the eve of another national election. AI is you know, barreling down this road, and you've got these four guys with their own proclivities. What is what are your biggest fears about this election, misinformation, um, right. you know, the whole ball of wax? Okay, so. First thing, it's very important for everybody to understand that Elon Musk on X has far more commercial volume and power than anybody who's on television. So, so Tucker Carlson at his height on Fox News was lucky if he got three million people a night. Elon Musk has 140 million followers and he has forced his people to tweak the algorithm in such a way that unless you actually block him, you're gonna see every bit of wisdom that he tweets out, mm -hmm. and he does it five to seven, 10, sometimes 20 times a day. Whoa. So last week he tweeted out, oh, all the illegal aliens coming across the border could vote, can vote. I didn't know that. Well, this is complete nonsense. But that was seen by 50 million people hmm. who think that Elon Musk knows what he's talking right. about. And so this is dangerous. And so they, of course, all of them, are desperate for Trump to come back into power because 
he would get rid of Lena Kahn, who was the head of the Federal Trade Commission, who was making their lives miserable. She has sued Google. She has sued Facebook. Mm. She's about to sue Twitter mm. or X. Uh, and, and so the notion of antitrust enforcement and all of that would go out the window mm -hmm. if Trump was put back in. So they would, they would like him to come back to power. And they're going to do everything they can to make sure that happens. What about, um, I'm interested what you think or your fears about foreign inter interference in this election, given AI now um, right. barreling down this road. Well, here's the real problem. I mean, I assume everybody here knows about deep fakes. So AI now makes it possible for literally anybody. There's a company that will do this for you. If you have um, words that you have want this person to say, they can take an image of Biden, and they could put words in his mouth and make his mouth literally form those up words. Yeah. To them. So I am sure that we'll see a lot of stumbling things that lead into this trope of he's too old. Mm -hmm. and, and these will be manufactured. Now, in a more normal world, these would have been blocked as they were uploaded to, because in the old days, it was content moderation. Uh, Musk doesn't think content moderation is worth it. Uh, and he says, so he's, he's basically gotten rid of the content moderators. So this stuff will all go out in, in the same way that the AI versions of Taylor Swift nude was put on X last week. Mm. You know, these were totally manufactured images where they put Taylor Swift's head on a naked body of some porn actress. And X didn't take them down? And X eventually took them down. And why? Because Taylor Swift's fans got so crazy Interesting. that they truth bombed X. And eventually, after three or four days, X was forced to take them down. Hmm. But it was not, if not, you know, not everybody has, you know, 13, 15 million fans who can yeah, bomb you, yeah. a, a site uh, to get them to reverse Bessing. their behavior. You know, you and I talked quite a while ago about something that, that I don't think everybody really understands, which is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. You know, Rupert Murdoch paid a fine of $780 million dollars to a voting machine company this year, and he's probably going to have to pay another fine uh, for basically broadcasting stuff that was patently untrue. But both Twitter and Facebook put far more out about Smartmatic and, and Dominion than, than Fox did. Right. And never got sued. And that is because the government thank you, Al Gore and Bill Clinton, I'm afraid, said that these platforms are not publishers. So they cannot be held liable for anything that is put on them. Now, as if they are just passive platforms. Yeah. Now, you notice, with the exception of the Taylor Swift thing, there is no nudity on Facebook. Facebook spends probably 30 to 40 million a year on AI that when someone tries to upload pornography to Facebook, the AI sees the bare breast and shunts it into another queue in which a human has to look at it and decide whether they throw it in the trash or it's some kind of Margaret Mead ethnographic film mm -hmm. that maybe should <laughs> be on Facebook. So, they are editing stuff every day. They give you different content that they give me. Right. So this idea that they, are, they should not have any liability is nonsense. 
So if we revoke that safe harbor, their behavior would have to change immediately. Yes. They would have to spend millions of dollars on content moderation, and they might be liable for uh, you know, just publishing obvious untruths. Why don't we? Right. Why don't we? Why don't we revoke uh, Section 2? Because politicians are in the bag. These people give a lot of money to politicians, mm -hmm. and every time it gets close to passing, they, they bring out the big guns. Well, let's go to some good news then. <laughs> I should have warned you, I can ruin any dinner party, and I do weddings and bar mitzvahs. So it's a, um, and we haven't started talking about Gaza yet. So um, what will AI mean for authors, music artists that you've worked with over the years? Um, I had a really funny experience in inverted commas, my, my editor called me um, a couple months ago and um, just slightly sheepish and said, Tom, I, I, I'm really sorry to bother you with this, but there's a woman on Twitter that's getting a lot of traction saying she can prove that your last column was written by ChatGPT. <laughs> now, I just have to ask you. I mean, I, I know I feel silly even asking this, but it wasn't written by ChatGPT, was it? I said I don't even know. I wouldn't even know how to do it, you know. Um, uh, but what is this going to mean for creative artists of well, all sorts? I think it's problematic, as as you know. I've spent twenty years producing movies for Marty Scorsese and Vim Vendors and Gus Van Zandt, and and there was a strike, two strikes this summer in Hollywood, specifically about AI and the creative class. So from the writer's point of view, uh, Marvel wanted the ability to put every single screenplay they'd ever owned into a large learning model like ChatGPT. And then with Instead of paying a screenwriter five, six hundred thousand dollars to write a first draft screenplay mm -hmm. for a new Marvel movie, they would now have a prompt writer, and that person would basically put into maybe three paragraphs Captain America meets the Hulk in Iceland in the second act. Mm. Black Widow comes yeah. in and saves the day. Third act, is, it ends here. And literally in four or five hours, the large learning model would turn out a first draft screenplay. OK, first now they got a problem. The copyright office will not give a copyright to anything that's been written by a machine. Mm. So then they'd hire some poor out of work screenwriter, and they say, OK, take this and polish mm. it, and we'll let you put your name on it. So then they could get a, a copyright. How many books on Amazon now are actually written there's, by ChatGPT? There's Chat about GPT? 350 books on Amazon that are co-written by ChatGPT. Now, when I say co-written, I probably mean that they were written by ChatGPT and somebody who wrote the prompt put their name on it so they could get a copyright and they could publish it on Amazon, self-publish it. Do they have to split, a serious question, do they have to split the royalties with, uh, <laughs> with uh, well, look, OpenAI? I mean, I mean, look, the New York Times is suing OpenAI. Yes. I'm on the board of the Authors Guild. Yeah. We're suing OpenAI yes. on behalf of all <laughs> the authors. And basically we're saying, how did you do this? You took all this content yeah. into your machine without any permission, all of its copyright. So I can put into ChatGPT, write me a Stephen King mm. short story that's set in Vermont in 1950s, and it will do it. I can say to Google's music model, 
write me a Bob Dylan-like anti-war song from the 1960s. And it will do it. And it will actually sound kind of like a Bob Dylan, yes. too. Uh, you know, there's a quite famous incident last fall where uh, Drake and Weekend seem to have done a duet. Now, these are two rappers who've been fighting for years. And so this duet was going up on Spotify, and it went to number one hmm. instantly. It had about six million downloads. Hmm. And it turned out neither Drake nor Weekend had anything to do with it. Well, A person made it using their voices and made a new song and, and published. Now, fortunately, the, you know, the record companies yeah. came down on Spotify mm. like a ton of bricks yes. and they took it down, mm. but that's gonna be a continuing problem. Um, from the actor's point of view, the actor strike was essentially about, uh, studios wanna be able to take somebody's body and scan it and then own it for a one-time payment on that body. So instead of paying for an extra, and as you know, Tom, the only way you can actually get into the Screen Actors Guild is by being an extra and then a director giving right. you one line. Yeah. You get one line, then you can get your Screen Actors mm -hmm. Guild card. So essentially what they were gonna do was make a data bank of bodies which they could then clothe, period, contemporary, futuristic, put different hair on them, and they would own that body mm. forever for a one-time payment. Um, well, so they also have the technology now to take actors who have passed away, Sidney Poitier, for instance, sure. and star him in your current movie. Right. And he will sound exactly like. Right, right. Um, uh, and and these, these deep fakes will come in everywhere. Hmm. You know, I mean, one of the things that I'd like everybody to kind of think about in terms of AI is the following. Uh, the head of OpenAI, Sam Oldman, says that in the next 10 years, he calls it the uh, marginal cost of intelligence will fall very close to zero because of AI. And essentially what he sees is that white collar workers will be put out of work. Hmm. So I have a friend who ran for many years the largest PR firm in Hollywood. And at the height of his success, he had about 100 workers. And he said about 75 of them had no job but to create content, write press releases. And he said if he ran it today, he would run the firm with about five people to be salespeople. Mm -hmm. And the the AI would, the generative AI would do all the press releases. And they probably have someone to edit them right, and yeah. punch them up, but, but basically. So these are white collar workers who are making $150,000 a year. They're gonna be put out of business. Now, Altman says the only solution to this, because he thinks there would be riots in the streets, would be for the government to put what he calls universal basic income. Right. In other words, the government would pay everybody a certain flat amount of money to stay home in their pajamas. Now, that raises a lot of questions. <laughs> Do you think? First yeah. off, you know, a lot of people from Epicurus on have said that work is what gives us meaning. Right. So if you didn't have work, what would you feel like? And, and I have a friend, Angus Deaton, who teaches at Princeton, 
who's written about deaths of despair. And a lot of his work has been about people who went on disability, the factory cleared out of the town, they went on disability, they end up spending all day playing video games, and eventually they increase their Oxycontin to the point that they kill themselves. So, this worries me a lot. Yes. And so there's, there's two ways to think about this. You know, what does that mean? Is there any political will to create such a thing as uh, universal basic income? And what would a society like that be? Yeah. And, and on one level, I think, well, maybe for that copywriter at the PR firm who always wanted to write a novel, he wouldn't be earning as much, but he wouldn't have to pay for childcare. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. He'd be home all day. He could write that novel. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if in my neighborhood there were 50 people that were out of, had no work to do, and my friend Dennis up the street wanted to put up a small building to make it for an office, that we'd all, like the Amish, come together and do a barn raising, right? Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd, we'd build and miss out. So, I mean, that's, if you're trying to think of what's the upside of right. it, maybe there's a the thing, but I have a hard time imagining this is going to be a real thing. Um, one of the things I want to get to um, before we just take a little detour to the Middle East so, um, is you, you were talking in the book, John, about Facebook and Twitter and that for them, the polarization they generate um, is not a bug, it's a feature. Right. Why is that? Well, because it's something called engagement. They have found that if a, something makes you angry, you're more likely to stay on the platform than if it's just some benign right. picture of somebody's cat. Yeah. You know? And so they make the algorithm give you more stuff that will engage you. And they know how you go down those rabbit holes. And they want to keep you going down the rabbit hole because needless to say, every minute you stay on Facebook mm -hmm. it's or X is more money for them. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes this doesn't work out so well. So Elon Musk's company, he paid $44 million for Twitter. Um, one of his investors two weeks ago um, marked their shares down about 74% from how much they paid in. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. they took a 74% hit on their investment. My guess is it's the company is not worth anything. And so his response to that, of course, is to blame the Anti-Defamation League. Mm -hmm. The natural connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. He's basically said, if they weren't telling all the advertisers that their advertisements are surrounded by Nazi posts, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have any problems. I, I wouldn't have yeah. the fact that I've lost 70% yes. of my advertising yeah. revenue. And so this is the classic blame the messenger, you know, trope, you know. And um, this keeps me, and it's, it's the dopamine that keeps them on the site. Right, right, exactly. Negative, do negative thoughts keep people on more than positive ones? Yes, N way more, way more. Um, we have been collecting questions, and we'll, we'll go there, and maybe while we just get ready for that, I'll, I'll, I'll segue to um, just say a few words about Gaza, and then we'll yeah. come back and go through some of the questions. Why don't you do that, and then we'll do yeah. <laughs> Why don't I not? Is <laughs> uh, you got them? That's great. Speaking of, that, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a really, really good question. Do the, um, do the Gaza. Yeah. So uh, 
You know, my, my view of uh, what's been going on in the world and uh, uh, in Gaza, I will start at 30,000 feet. Um, what was happening on October 6th uh, globally is that um, Ukraine was trying to join the West uh, and Israel was trying to join the East. And Russia and Iran stopped the first and Iran and Hamas stopped the second. Um, that's basically what's going on. Um, uh, Ukraine, uh, has been trying to join uh, the European Union. And um, Putin understood that if uh, Ukraine, this uh, country with large population, now the most sophisticated land army in Europe, um, uh, the breadbasket of Europe, and a country of great technological prowess, full of engineers, if it were to join the European Union, we'd, pretty, we'd be pretty close, let's say, for the, some states in the Balkans to a Europe whole and free. Um, uh, and a Slavic successful European Union, uh, a Slavic successful Ukraine in the European Union would stand as a daily refutation of the um, Slavic kleptocracy of Putin, and he moved to stop that. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, he's been all too successful. Uh, at the same time, Israel was trying to join the East, that is, it was trying to have normalized relations with uh, Saudi Arabia, which has a vision of the Middle East that. Um, it would look increasing like the European Union with Saudi Arabia being kind of the Germany, the anchor, and connecting China and India and Africa and, um, uh, uh, and the West and Israel um, into a very different region. And if that were to go through, Iran and Hamas would have been much more isolated. And, um, uh, and there was a lot of concern among Palestinians, not just Hamas, that um, the terms under which Israel would normalize relations with Russia uh, Netanyahu wanted it to be on no terms, and Palestinians wanted to be at least on the terms that um, there would be progress toward a Palestinian state. So that was what, I, 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 that to me is all how I've covered this. That's the context of the, um, uh, of the war. Um, uh, I think this is a um, uh, uniquely bad time to be Secretary of State. And um, uh, if anybody asks you to be Secretary of State, <laughs> um, tell them you'd much prefer to be Secretary of Education or mm -hmm. is labor free. Um, uh, so why is that? Well, I'll date myself a little and say that um, when Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State after the 73 war, which was the last surprise attack that um, threatened Israel, um, and then he took up the challenge of forging a peace agreement between Israel, Syria, and um, Egypt, Henry Kissinger needed three dimes. He needed a dime to call Golda Meir. He needed a dime to call Anwar Sadat. And he needed a dime to call Syrian President Hafez al-Assad. And then three dimes in a plane, a couple months, peace agreement. You know, um, To be Secretary of State right now, you have to deal, first of all, with people who aren't even in the phone book. Um, if anyone knows the number of the Houthis, um, please call, OK? Um, uh, a third of whose population is illiterate. Um, half the country is water starved. But um, to some of the themes in, in John's book, um, we now have, uh, thanks to technology, um, uh, people in a country that is literally a failed state can um, literally go on Best Buy and Amazon and buy drones that, um, and with the help of Iran, obviously more sophisticated weapons, and interrupt global shipping um, and force the biggest shipping lines in the world to go not through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, but all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, um, raising shipping costs for everybody in the world. Um, and uh, you have what I, what I first identified in my book, Lexus and the Olive Tree, what I call super empowered, angry people. And, um, uh, but now you have so many of them. And so that's another, this war you really see every day is the Spanish Civil War of the 21st century. Everyone's trying out new weapons, uh, uh, a lot of them driven by technology. And, um, uh, and what's clear now is that drones have become the new IEDs. You remember from Iraq that we, um, uh, one, one of the things that debilitated American troops in Iraq was the Iraqis learned, again, for just very low uh, cost to take a grenade, tie it to a clock or a watch, 
um, and um, or any other device and, and bury it in the road and you could blow up a, an American armored personnel carrier. So asymmetric warfare is everywhere and trying to unwind that is gonna be, we were just, three Americans were tragically killed by a drone strike, you've all read, you know, uh, at a base in Northern Jordan. Um, and we, we're not really sure where it came from. Yeah, I mean, we, we know it's uh, Shia militias in Iraq, but um, attribution now becomes enormously um, difficult. Um, I, I would just say, and, I'll, uh, and, and stop here, that um, uh, I think the real challenge for Israel now, and it's a hellish challenge, is that Israel's losing on three fronts right now. Uh, it's, it's losing on the narrative front, um, uh, despite the fact that it was attacked, that Hamas broke the ceasefire, that um, uh, its civilians in pre-1967 Israel were, were killed, mothers in front of kids, uh, parents in front of children, uh, women were raped. Um, Israel's lost the narrative because in retaliating against Gaza, against uh, Hamas, which embedded itself among civilians, um, uh, it's killed thousands of Gazan civilians. And um, you put all that on TikTok and on video and, yeah. and whatnot, and um, uh, that's a very hard narrative to win anymore. Um, so it's, it's lost the narrative war. Um, it's lost the morning after war, in large part because Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, is refusing to hold a cabinet meeting to discuss the morning after um, uh, because it will have to have some Palestinian component and the right wing members of his cabinet um, insist that there be none. In fact, there was a huge rally in Jerusalem uh, in the biggest theater in Jerusalem yesterday where you had a whole bunch of people come out for resettling Gaza um, uh, with Jewish settlements. Not the best idea. And, um, uh, and lastly, Israel's losing on the regional front. Um, it's being surrounded by America has two aircraft carriers in the Middle East, um, uh, one in the Mediterranean, one in the Persian Gulf, aircraft carrier groups. And Iran basically has four what I call landcraft carriers. They're called Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and uh, Shia militias. So these are just like aircraft carriers uh, on land. They're platforms to protect power um, and that also give Iran what I call um, uh, implausible deniability, um, that it has nothing to do with their actions. And um, uh, the only way to deal with that kind of threat is um, with a coalition. And, uh, and so what I've been arguing in my columns is that the only way Israel can reverse <clears throat> the narrative, um, the only way it can have a partner for the morning after, um, uh, the only way it can have a regional coalition uh, is if it has a legitimate, credible, effective, Palestinian partner um, uh, tied to a process for some kind of two-state solution. Now, Israelis rightly and understandably say, don't even talk to me about a two-state solution in a Palestinian state. It, one can totally understand that. Um, unfortunately, it can't overcome these, these dilemmas um, without that Palestinian partner. And my hope is after, um, if we get a ceasefire and a hostage release here, right. Um, that because the hostages, again, understandably, make Israelis really crazy, and that's really frozen a lot of the politics, um, that we can return to the discussion of a Palestinian state, but it'll have to be very different. Um, we'll have to talk about demilitarization, um, really strict controls. Uh, you can't just say, hey, let's have a Palestinian state. Israelis aren't going to go for that uh, in the least. So that discussion hasn't begun, and we're going to have to look to Palestinians also to take the initiative uh, because that state has to be legitimate, credible, and effective uh, from, from their point of view and everyone else's. So um, that's, um, that's where we are, um, I, best I could say, in, in five minutes. Um, and I, I have zero visibility about where this is going to go. I have no idea um, how this story ends. And um, so I'm being really cautious in what I write. Um, I find it one of the most difficult times to write about this issue because it's just so emotionally fraught and sad um, because getting our way back to equilibrium is going to be very difficult. Emotionally, the nature of the violence has been so vicious 
very hard to get people emotionally back to where they were. Technologically, we have all these super empowered people now. Um, diplomatically, everyone's just kind of tired. You just sort of see it in our diplomats. It's like, God, do we really have to do this again? Um, and Secretary of State Blinken's been to the Middle East, I think, six times since the war started, five or six right. times. It's actually really exhausting. Um, and physically, um, just uh, you have now 500,000 settlers in the West Bank. You have Hamas with a network of tunnels that Israel may have only discovered 20% of. There's just so many physical barriers to things. So, so I'll end where I began. Um, I can ruin any dinner party. And um, uh, now you know why. And um, I do do weddings and bar mitzvahs. So let's, John, get to some of the questions. Thank I, you. Um, I just want to say, as a friend, but also as a, a reader, that you've been doing some of the best work of your life. Well, last, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that means a lot. It's the most important story of my life. Um, I've been, I'm 70. I've been doing this um, for a long time. And um, this is the most important time, I think, in my career. Not just for this issue, because we're, we're just at such a 1989 moment, technologically, for the right. reasons you're talking about, John, um, geopolitically, and um, it's a time for your A game. John, um, uh, if someone asks you, what is real today, what would you say? What is real yeah. today? How do we know what's real anymore? What's real today for me is um, I'm involved with a, something called the Americana Music Foundation. And it's, it's a group of artists all over the country who play gospel, bluegrass, what used to be called folk music, what kind of is what Brandy Carlisle calls outlaw country, you mm -hmm. know. Um, the stuff they won't allow you to do in Nashville. And, and these people get together and they play acoustic instruments and they sing in harmony and they come from a deep tradition of music that's been going back to the Carter family to, you know, to the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. and, and that's real. It is real and moving and beautiful. And uh, so that's... That's one thing that's real. That's good to know. You can still do that. What are the regulations? If you could wave a magic wand, um, uh, be, be, um, be king for a day, and impose two regulations, um, uh, one on AI and one on social networks, um, that would you know, get the most bang for the buck in terms right. of getting us back to something normal, what would they be? Well, the first one I've, I've mentioned already, which is we'd have to get rid of this Section 230. Get, and that would change social networks a lot. Um, AI needs uh, regulation. And, and the first thing is that they can't just take anybody's work, yours included, as the time suit points, and just suck it in and, and spit it out for their own profit without compensation. So they got to pay the people. And, and that applies to all sorts of worlds, like art. So one of the image generators took 12 million photographs from Getty Images and just ingested them into the system. All of those photographs were copyrighted. And so if I can, I can ask for a photograph of, give me a photograph of Joni Mitchell in 1850s as a saloon singer. And it will do that. And it'll look just like Joni Mitchell and then it put me in, the, in a saloon in the 1850s. Well, how did it get that? Well, it's because it took in 100 images of Joni Mitchell from Getty Images and that's how it, it got to do that. But Getty Images didn't get anything, and the yeah. photographers who took those pictures didn't get anything, and so that's got to stop. I would say one other thing, and you know, having been a professor at USC for a while, um, I'd like to see schools get a little more courageous and tell students they can't have their phone in school. 
I must tell you that, you know, I, I used to give a big lecture course, uh, 200 students, about the digital entertainment business. And everyone was sitting in a room kind of like this, but with desk in front of them. And they all had their laptops open. And occasionally I would, because I was mic'd up like this, I would just come down from the stage and kind of wander up. Mm -hmm. and I. I'd say, they're all on Facebook. They're not taking notes on my lecture. <laughs> they're all checking their likes. You know, so I mean, that's pretty dispiriting yeah. as a professor. And, and, and so uh, somehow I'd like to see that, you know, th that kind of behavior. I mean, the funny thing is that a lot of the people I know who are in the tech business don't even allow their 12-year-olds to have a phone. They think it's too dangerous, you know? So I, you know, I'm uh, somewhat famously, I've never looked at Twitter, I've never looked at Facebook, and I've never smoked a cigarette. And my plan is to die saying all three. Um, and because I consume no social media, I joke with people that in my world, everybody likes me. Um, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, certainly not true, but um, uh, because I'm, I'm just with the people I want to be with, and I don't take in any social media at all. Right. And, um, and so you'll never see me walk into a, a dinner with you and say, John, did you see what was tweeted about me? That was so unfair. I just, right. y'all, if you're all tweeting about me, you all have a good time. Right. But I'm not there. You know? Now, actually, I do use Twitter, as some of you may know, as a broadcast platform. So I have 900,000 odd you know, Twitter followers, but it's just for my column. And my assistant, Gwen, is the one who runs that, and she tweets out the column. And if you come to me and say, Tom, would you tweet out a link to my book? I'd be happily to do it. I don't know how to do it, but Gwen will do it right. for you. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I just find that personally in my own life, you know, I leak no energy. I just find all of that just such an energy drain. Su drain you know what I mean? Yes. And so I don't leak energy. Um, uh, you know, responding to that, uh, I'm just sort of really so, so forward looking. My wife and I took our children and our grandchildren to Tanzania last summer. Hmm. And of course, we get to this camp that we're staying in, and the teenagers, uh, grandchildren who were 16, 13, and 11, discover almost immediately that there's no cell coverage, <laughs> there's no Wi-Fi, there's nothing. And for about six hours, they were upset. And I said, you might as well just put your phones off, turn them off, and put them in your suitcase, because you're not going to have anything for the next 10 days. And they did that. And by the second day, they were totally fine. They were looking around. And their parents eventually said to me, what's happening? This is magical. <laughs> they're, they're engaged at the dinner table. They're, ta they're looking around, and they want to use my wife as a photographer. They want to use her real camera to take, you know, it was, it was wonderful. It was transformational. And they got over it really quickly, yeah. the, the addiction. It's a it's important, you know, in, in journalism, it's really been a curse because when I was first in Beirut, you know, I mean, that was even before CNN, you know, right. so um, uh, as a reporter, you could really shape the story. You know, it took a while, you have to be immerse yourself in the story. Right. But if you were there for a while, you could say, I think the story is this, and I'm going to go there, even if everyone's going the other way. And um, now, as a foreign, and I, I started as a wire service reporter at the UPI, and then you had to file a caption, you know, for a picture, um, you know, do a spot, do a new lead. It was constantly, and everything's come full circle now. Now, as a reporter, you have to tweet, you have to respond to tweets. You know, this is a newspaper reporter, you know, right. um, and everything has four bylines on it. You know, I don't even know how you write something with three other people. You know, I mean, it's. Um, right. Uh, it, it's really, really changed you know, the whole, whole nature yeah. of journalism. Um, there's a question here that I think is a really good one, and they're all good, actually. Um, but uh, is there a path forward where we can bring China closer into our global alliance? 
and, I, and we were talking about this at dinner yeah. before, because I think it's a, it's a really uh, important point. Um, you know, I, I, I think the big divide in the world today, and I, I wrote about this a little last week, is that um, uh, is, um, they're, they're basically, the world is cleaving between two giant networks, one I call the resistance network and one I call the inclusion network. And what is uh, fascinating for me, I'm actually doing a new forward to, from Beirut to Jerusalem, which is about the fact that I, um, I arrived, I went to graduate school um, at, at Oxford, studied Arabic at Oxford, and got hired in Fleet Street in 1978. And um, uh, the number two man in the Beirut Bureau of UPI got shot um, uh, in the ear by a man robbing a jewelry store on Hummer Street, and they came to me and said, would you like to go to Beirut? Uh, your predecessor got shot. And, um, uh, and um, uh, I said, yeah, I, I was young and stupid, and, and so I mm -hmm. took my little wife from Des Moines, Iowa, and off to Beirut we went. And, and we landed in 1979. Now here's the things that happened in my first year on the job with my big old black typewriter. My kids, a typewriter was a device. If you press the key, it created pressure on it. Um, and uh, the Iranian Revolution happened. The takeover of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, which was one of the most important events of the late 20th century, um, but was so difficult to cover that it never got the attention it deserved because Saudi Arabia, just as Iran took a giant right turn with Shia Islam, Saudi Arabia took a giant right turn with Sunni Islam, which actually ended up in 9-11. The Iranian Revolution, take over the Grand Mosque in Mecca, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, um, and Three Mile Island. Now, the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, in which no one was killed, and a small amount of radioactive material got leaked, um, coincided very quickly with a movie called The China Syndrome. And those two events led to the fact that we never built another nuclear reactor um, for the next 40 right. years. So we became that much more dependent on, um, uh, on fossil fuels right. uh, because of that. That meant these two countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia, who were going through these giant right turns, had more money than ever to spread a different version of Islam. But also in 1979, Dubai opened Jebel Ali port, which created this hub of globalization, of inclusion uh, in the Arab world. First climate report, the Charney report, came out in 1979. Right. So you really see the, the, these two kind of networks, um, the inclusion network, which is really about Dubai, um, and Camp David was signed in 1979. Right. So Camp David in Dubai, we really gave you the inclusion network. Um, Iran um, uh, and the um, uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan gave you the, um, uh, the resistance network. And those have only expanded today, and that's the real fight out there. And China is hovering in between the two. Can't quite figure out where to go. It knows in its head it really belongs with the world of inclusion, I mean, given its trade profile. But in its heart, you know, it's got this resistance to America, you know, and wanting to set the rules um, itself, to which I always say to the Chinese, like, these new rules you want to set, you know, like, I mean, you know, you did better under our rules than we did. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, I mean, like, what are you even talking about? But I do believe that um, if we're going to manage this world that we're going into now, John, that uh, we can't do it without China. And I'm a huge believer in Biden to Beijing, um, that we need to do, I think China's got a very difficult emperor right now, uh, Xi Jinping. Um, uh, and I don't think it would be easy. But I think they're, they're going through some really hard times now and be more open to it. But peeling China away from Russia, I think, is the biggest geopolitical challenge right. in the world today. You do that and you have a much more, uh, and I don't know if it's possible. So, but, you know. so in 2003, when I was just starting to teach at USC, um, I was invited to a a seminar run by the Global Business Network, which was... GBN. You talked about in the book. Yeah, Stuart Brand. Yeah, um, Peter Schwartz. Peter Schwartz. Schwartz. I, I know those guys, yeah. Yeah. And they created this matrix of, of where the world was going. And they're, they're the first futurists, I mean, among them. I mean... Yeah. And there were two, like any four-by-four, four, you know, matrix. 
One variable was, would the sources of leadership and power come from centralized, top-down, hierarchical forces or from decentralized, bottom-up network forces? And the other matrix was, will the global economic and cultural influence of the United States increase or decrease? Now, this is post 9-11. Yeah. Everybody's freaked out about what, where will our things. I still think that matrix is very true. And I think the basic problem the Chinese have is it's too hierarchical, centralized, top down. And if we can figure out how to navigate a world that's more decentralized, more bottom up, more networked, which we have all the tools to do, we can continue to succeed. And I, I think what's happening right now economically between, you know, on one hand, Evergrande, the largest property developer in China, literally going under. And on the other hand, now we're having very good economic readings in the United States. I think we have to stop being scared. And, and the problem is, if you look at the heritage foundations map of where the Bush, I mean, the Trump, next Trump administration is going. It's all hair on fire. We have to kill China. We're going to be in a war with China in two years, and we have to get ready for it. And it's crazy. It's Tom Cotton, you know, and all these Looney Tunes yeah. guys saying, we got to go and get ready because they're going to invade Taiwan next week. My, I'm highly skeptical. Uh, I don't think China, with all the economic problems it's got, is interested in having a world war where their commerce just comes to an end. Yeah, I, I think they've got, there's a lot of mixed feelings there, but I think on balance, um, if I were wishing one move um, on this administration, um, uh, uh, and, and, and God willing it has a chance in the future, um, if we can peel China off, because if you think about the world that, and I'll conclude here, that we grew up in, you know, um, the last 40 years in particular, um, I've been a journalist since 78, it was characterized by three things. One was a strong America. Um, right. That could, um, uh, we made mistakes to be sure, but that on balance, you know, was a source of order for the world and uh, for multilateral institutions and trade. Second was a steadily growing China that even 2008 could really help buoy the world when we stumbled, you know. We always counted them for their 6% growth. And the third was stable borders in the developing world. Right. So, um, and right now we have a, a stumbling America that can't quite um, uh, impose itself, or, or there's a lot of forces that don't want to get out of Ukraine, not give the Ukrainians any money, do anything, you know. We're like a big elephant that a lot of people are putting um, you know, spears into right now. Right. Uh, this regularly growing China, not, um, don't count on that. Um, right. And I don't have to tell you what's happened to stable borders in the developing world. You know, um, they've eroded, which has given us this huge immigration crisis. Um, and my view is the only way you can manage that um, kind of world stably, um, because it's no longer a world divided between North, South, East, West, communist capitalists. It's a world of order and the world of disorder. Right. Um, at the core, you have to have U.S.-China together. Um, and, you know. You and I, I've used this before where you, a famous Italian philosopher said, Gramsci, he said, the old is dying and the new is having a hard time being born. In this interregnum, many morbid symptoms appear. That's where we are. We're in an Indian right. Yes. Uh, the old is dying, and yet we have a president who's running on, uh, you know, a gospel of nostalgia: make America great again. So it's essentially let's go backwards. And then you have people like these characters who think they believe in the gospel of progress. Andreessen says there is no problem technology cannot solve. Well, we just talked about problems that technology has created, and they're going to create a lot more. 
So, I mean, neither of those views of the world, the gospel yeah. of progress or the gospel of nostalgia, are right for the moment. And we have to think differently. Well, just to close, then, I think I would take a line from your book, John, which is that um, it's drawing on nature to um, solve some of these problems. And for me, uh, it comes to asking the question, which ecosystems thrive in nature when the climate changes? And that the ecosystems that build emergently, in the case of nature, what I call complex, or what are called by biologists, complex adaptive networks. Well, the elements of the ecosystem network together to maximize their resilience and productivity. But nature does it emergently. The deer eats the grass, the lion eats the deer. It's a violent process. But the net effect is actually stability, a complex adaptive network. And what nature does emergently, we need to do consciously by building what I call complex adaptive coalitions. Right. And um, it's got to be in the country and, uh, and globally. But um, the cement of those is the two things that have always been the cement truth and trust, and um, this book, uh, The End of Reality, is about four guys who want to really erode truth and right. trust. Run, don't walk, to Amazon or your local bookstore and buy it right now. Thank you all for coming.